started real early, 13, 14, 15. And a lot of people don't notice, even people who knew about the rampers don't notice. When we originally got together, when we were real young, we were the Black Panthers. We got this picture of a Black Panther and put it on our jacket. and We didn't like it. Eventually, we knew about a gang that existed, the Rampers. They were the Rampers Seniors and the Rampers Juniors. Now, some of those guys were, you know, in the neighborhood, everybody knew who they were. There was all kinds of guys, and they were real tough guys, and they were much older than we were. The juniors were older, the seniors were even older than them. We wound up talking to them, they talked to us, and they wanted to take us in. So we joined them. When we became the Rampa Midgets. And uh, they had a place on 64th Street or 66th Street and uh, 14th Avenue. There was an empty lot. And they built a clubhouse out of plywood and no electric. There was candles in there and stuff like that. And they would take us in there and uh, they wanted to toughen us up. And uh, what they would do by toughen us up was beat us up. Punch us, kick us, slap us, spit in our face, and just all kinds of things to, to toughen us up. And sometimes we caught a good beat, and sometimes we got reacted back, and we got a real good beat. Sometimes you got hit with his hands, a guy's hand, or sometimes with a bat or a stick or something. And in a way, it was toughening us up, but we didn't like it. We stood on 79th Street in New York Avenue, and there was a bunch of us. Uh, Jerry Papa, uh, Joe Vitale, Tommy Snake, uh, Mikey Michio, Artie Gord. There was a whole host of different guys that I explained. Us, it was the Rampers, us, the Rampa Midgets, against the world. The Mafia was all over the neighborhood. We knew about them. We didn't care about them. We, want, we didn't bother with them. We tried to stay away from them. They were dangerous, but it, we didn't care about those. It was a us against the world type of thing. My street had heard rumors of my tough reputation, but they had only heard it. It's secondhand. Despite this, my loved ones saw past it and saw the good in me. I never got involved in drugs or caused trouble at home. I held utmost respect for my parents especially considering I was the only son. I fulfilled the expectations placed upon me, such as taking out the garbage, cleaning the walkway, shoveling snow, and carrying home groceries, even if I may have complained a little. I had a great relationship with everyone on our block, genuinely liking them, and I believe they felt the same way about me. Despite my rebellion, my father remained unwavering in his efforts to guide me towards a better path. You have the potential to master a trade, he insisted. Embrace the physicality, the hard labor, a little honest sweat never harmed anyone. Occasionally, I reluctantly joined him at the dress factory, and his acquaintances would extend offers of employment in construction, machine shops, or car repair. However, by then, I had fully immersed myself in a different existence and tangled with the rampers. In the midst of a tumultuous mob conflict within the Profoxy family, a pivotal role was played by the Gallo brothers hailing from downtown Brooklyn's President Street. Larry Gallo, along with his brother Joey and their crew, found themselves discontented with their share of the profit. On one occasion, myself, Jimmy Emma, Gary Papa, Joe V, Tommy Snake, and Lenny the Mole were gathered at our habitual hangout spot on 79th Street and Utrecht Avenue, where we unexpectedly encountered individuals associated with the Gallo faction. Though not directly the Gallo brothers themselves, tensions escalated due to an apparent dispute with Jimmy Emma. A threatening scenario unfolded as they resorted to firepower, leaving us with no choice but to make a hasty exit. We regrouped, armed ourselves, and bravely returned to the bar. In the depths of a spacious saloon, a clear divide separated us from them. Tension hung heavy in the air as it appeared that one of their party made a move towards a firearm, reacting swiftly. We instinctively, we instinctively reached for our own weapon. A barrage of gunshots ensued, echoing through the room, transforming the scene into a spectacle 
resembling a Wild West film. The chaos was surreal, with shattering glass, terrified women shrieking, and various objects crashing to the floor. Astonishingly, one of the Gallo associates endured an astonishing 11 gunshot wounds, yet managed to stumble out of the establishment and collapse onto the pavement. Against all odds, he miraculously survived. Meanwhile, an unsuspecting bystander also suffered a gunshot to the foot, silently seeking medical attention without uttering a word about the incident. Remarkably, the wounded gala member remained equally tight-lipped at the hospital. However, news quickly spread throughout the community that the Gallo family had set their sights on us. The whole neighborhood seemed to be buzzing with discussions, and even the local mobsters on the street corner took an interest. Intense meetings were held, with the Profasi family and even the Gambino family getting involved. We heard that our fellow neighborhood residents had informed the Gambinos about us, highlighting our tough yet well-behaved reputation. The Gambinos decided to intervene on our behalf, standing up to the Gallus and categorically stating, you won't lay a finger on these kids. They're decent kids from this neighborhood. They never came into your territory to cause trouble. They stick to their own turf. So back off. We were only informed of this turn of events from hearsay, though we remained prepared for anything, for anything. We were later informed that the situation had been resolved and it was over. However, we kept our guard up. You can never be too certain. Prior to my inclusion, the rampers already established an intricate network that facilitated the illegal acquisition and distribution of firearms, handling of stolen goods through fences, the support of bail bondsmen, and the provision of legal assistance. Our primary activities involved conducting burglaries and stealing automobiles. These cars were targeted either for disassembly and sale of individual parts or to be shipped overseas. However, we deliberately refrained from burglarizing private residences as it contradicted our group's objectives. Instead, we exclusively targeted commercial establishments, breaking in during nighttime to rob clothing and hardware stores. We also engaged in daring heists at jewelry stores, where we donned ski masks to conceal our identities. It's worth noting that all of these stores had insurance coverage, minimizing their financial losses. Police officers were always causing trouble for me. It led to my first encounter with the law. We were hanging out in front of a small diner when a cop car pulled up. The officer behind the wheel happened to be Italian, although his name escapes me. Let's just call him Bruno. Bruno was an absolute nuisance. He shouted at us to vacate the street, prompting everyone to scatter in different directions. I hurried down the block and took refuge in the entrance of a nearby bar, thinking I was off the street and out of harm's way. To my surprise, Bruno followed me and barked, I told you to get off the street. I shot back. Do you need your eyes checked? I'm clearly off the street. In response, he swiftly exited his vehicle and advanced towards me, his intention to strike me with his nightstick evident. Without hesitation, I positioned myself and delivered a quick blow to his jaw, sending him sprawling to the ground. I couldn't resist giving him a swift kick to the face. Just then, the other cop from the car emerged, brandishing his gun. I was swiftly apprehended for assaulting an officer through some connections. I managed to secure the services of a skilled lawyer. Well, versed in navigating the state courts. And boy, did I learn a valuable lesson about the importance of having connections in the real world. My case experienced a few postponements while I remained out on bail. However, on the third rescheduled court date, things took a turn as I met my lawyer outside the courthouse. He advised me to stay downstairs until he called for my presence. When my name was eventually called, the judge couldn't find me. A bench warrant was issued, and Officer Bruno left, unaware of what was unfolding. Shortly after, my lawyer located me and ushered me into court. He had deliberately requested delays 
in order to secure a specific prosecutor for my case. Addressing the judge, he explained, Your Honor, my client has just arrived. He was delayed due to a car accident. I understand your calendar is full, and there are extenuating circumstances surrounding this case. Your Honor, I propose that my client pleads guilty to a misdemeanor. The judge agreed, as this eliminated the need to reschedule with the absent officer Bruno. The motion was granted, and I received a fine of $500. Little did Bruno know that he had been set up. Immediately following the court proceedings, my friends and I returned to the luncheonette where the incident had occurred. It was conveniently situated near the local precinct. While enjoying our hamburgers, Bruno walked in. Spotting me, he adopted a smug demeanor and proclaimed, you failed to appear in court. There's a bench warrant out for your arrest. I'm taking you in. Not so fast, I retorted. They actually issued a bench warrant for your mother. My case is over. I went to court, pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor, and received a fine. I even have a couple of days to pay it. My buddies burst into laughter while Bruno turned beet red. Confused, he sat down on a stool. I leaned over to the person at the counter and said, Hey, Bo, whatever Bruno is having, put it on my tab. I'm celebrating today, shocked, Bo replied. You can't cover his bill. Well, I guess that's a first for you, I smirked, and together we walked out amused by the whole situation. During my time in Bensonhurst, I found myself embarking on a continuous streak of robberies alongside the rampers. We often gathered at our beloved corner luncheonette located at the intersection of 79th Street and Utrecht Avenue. Meanwhile, my parents had decided to retire. They underwent renovations to transform our vacation cottage on Long Island into a permanent residence. Even though they had moved away, they retained ownership of our house on 78th Street, where I temporarily settled in the downstairs apartment. Eventually, my father made the decision to sell the house. He persistently encouraged me to join him and my mother in Ronkonkoma, emphasizing the abundance of available construction work. You could sculpt a comfortable living out here, my father assured me. Contrarily, a stroke of luck landed me a sweet opportunity, and I managed to secure an apartment in Bensonhurst with a waterfront view. The place even boasted a doorman, just as Lorraine had assured. However, unexpected ultimatums arose as she now yearned for marriage, urging me to obtain a stable job and settle down. Yet, my turbulent lifestyle had me wrapped up in high-risk ventures once more. The prospect of an eventual occupation did not intrigue me in the least. Nevertheless, I found myself caught between conflicting desires. Deep down, my affection for Lorraine was undeniable. And despite my reputation as a tough street dweller, her family embraced me warmly. Her father, a dear man known as Nick the Baker, ran a bakery that I would frequently visit. It wasn't for employment, mind you, but simply to be in their midst. The bakery operated as a family affair with her grandmother as the true owner. Our bond was strong, jovial even. However, Lorraine and I inhabited divergent worlds. She craved a respectable existence with a steady job and children, while I found myself spiraling further away from such expectations. No disagreements or quarrels ensued, yet the disparity became increasingly undeniable. Lorraine pursued a legitimate path, while I found myself drifting miles apart, entangled in a whole different realm. During that era, we were young and foolish enough, I suppose, to believe we were untouchable. That perception shifted abruptly. It happened one night when I accompanied one of the rampers, Joe V, on a robbery mission. First. We needed to steal a car, armed with a 45 caliber gun and wearing a ski mask. I had reached a point where disguises were a necessary precaution. We spotted a suitable vehicle and proceeded to hotwire it. I assumed the role of the driver as we ventured about four or five blocks away from the scene of the theft. At a red light, another car aggressively pulled up right beside us. Behind the wheel was a man and there was another man hanging out of the window with what appeared to be a rifle. He began shouting, threatening our lives and demanding that we pull over immediately. 
In an attempt to defuse the situation, I quickly interjected. Whoa, calm down. What's the problem? His enraged response confirmed that we had indeed stolen his car. I continued to plead for calm, reiterating, all right, all right, all right, let's not do anything irrational. As I raised my hand in an attempt to pacify him, I stealthily reached for my 45. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed the passenger, seemingly a bystander, turning towards the driver momentarily, sharing some information. Reacting swiftly, I aimed the gun and pulled the trigger. To my horror, nothing happened. Beads of sweat formed on my forehead as the armed man redirected his weapon towards us. Beside me, Joe was in a state of panic, screaming, go, go. I slammed my foot on the gas pedal, pushing the vehicle to its limits. They pursued us relentlessly, gunfire ringing out behind us. Suddenly, Joe let out a pained groan, clutching his stomach. A bullet had penetrated the car's rear, passing through the back seat, piercing Joe's back, exiting through his stomach, grazing his knee, and ultimately hitting the dashboard. I frantically maneuvered, racing and swerving at high speeds, colliding with multiple parked cars. The car spun out of control, hurtling us towards an inevitable end. But then the sound of police sirens filled the air. The pursuing car abruptly screeched to a stop. Evidently, whoever they were, they wanted no part in involving the authorities. Joe, I urgently called out, let's get the hell out of here. We abandoned the car and hobbled a considerable distance away. Joe collapsed onto a lawn in agony. I gripped him firmly, dragging him into a nearby alley. We sought refuge beneath a small shed or makeshift structure. The distant wailing of police sirens echoed through the streets. Joe, I reassured, will be all right. Weakly, he murmured, Sammy, I'm dying. Joe, you're not dead yet, I replied firmly. So come on. With great effort, I guided him further down the alley, reaching another street near a bustling avenue. Desperate to escape attention, we flagged down a taxi. Despite our best attempts to appear normal, crimson stains covered our bodies. The cab driver, startled by the bloodstains in the darkness of the night, demanded we wait. Frustrated and without my gun, which I had left in the stolen car, I formed my hand into a clenched fist, pressing it threateningly against his neck. Start driving, or I'll blow your damn brains out. Forcing him to take us back to our neighborhood, where my car awaited, the apprehensive cabbie wasted no time waiting for payment. I assisted Joe into the vehicle and sped towards the residence of another ramper known as Gary Papa. However, Papa had recently aligned himself with a powerful figure in the Genovese family, a May guy known as Dutchie. Papa aided in applying a bandage to Joe's wounds, attempting to halt the bleeding. I implored Papa for immediate medical assistance, aware that a hospital would expose us to potential arrest. I suggested seeking help from Dutchie. Papa agreed, saying, all right, Sammy, I'll drive. Eventually, we located Dutchie. Drifting in and out of consciousness, I remember opening my eyes briefly, meeting Dutchie's horrified gaze and hearing him mutter, Pap, they're dead. What the hell can I do? Look at them. Papa returned to the car and declared, here's what I'll do. I'll drive you to Coney Island Hospital and you two jump out and try to walk in. By this point, Joe's moans had intensified. Defiantly, I declared, forget the hospital. I'm not going. Papa pressed, Joe will die. Well, then take Joe there, I coldly responded. And so that was precisely what occurred. We approached the emergency entrance of the hospital. The door swung open and we propelled Joe out. He collapsed limply on the ground. Papa warned me that I, too, might bleed to death without medical attention. Yet, despite feeling dizzy and weakened, I remained conscious and the bleeding gradually subsided. During my time of recuperation, I coincidentally encountered a childhood friend, Gary Latorica, 
who had been drafted around the same time as me. He approached me with an opportunity to make some good money. Sammy, he said, there's this beauty school in downtown Brooklyn that teaches all aspects of skin care and hair cutting. Astonished, I replied. Are you out of your mind? I'm not a beautician. He quickly reassured me saying, no, you would just enroll in the hair cutting classes. As an ex-GI, the government covers the expenses and you receive tax-free unemployment benefits while learning a trade. The owner of the school is only interested in government funding. You can come and go as you please. And here's the kicker. There are about 600 girls there, both full-time and part-time, with only five guys, including me. Two of them are openly gay, so you can consider them women. Out of the remaining three, one is part-time and only attends at night. Skeptical, I replied. I don't know. I'll have to think about it. However, fate led me to meet a girl from my neighborhood named Lorraine, who happened to attend the beauty school. It's a different Lorraine. Not the one I used to date, but one I always had my eye on. Um, she burst into laughter and said, this school is wild. The girls here are absolutely crazy. Piquing my interest, I inquired, what's happening over there? To my surprise, she responded, all they think about is sex. You wouldn't believe the way they talk. Trust me, you'll need incredible stamina. After a couple of days, you won't be able to walk straight. Intrigued by the prospect, I accompanied Gary to meet the school's owner, an older gentleman. I made my intentions clear, stating, if I agree to do this, I'm only interested in the unemployment benefits. I'll attend when I feel like it, but once I'm bored, I'll be out. He nodded in understanding, and then his gaze fell upon the concealed gun in my jacket. I won't be controlled by anyone, I asserted. Surprisingly, he replied, all right, do as you please, content with our understanding. He asked me to fill out the necessary government and unemployment form. Aware of my limited paperwork skills, I requested his assistance, showcasing my gun again. He reluctantly agreed, giving me a glimpse of his acceptance. The beauty school turned out to be quite an experience. They offered classes on nail care, but I found myself becoming their practice dummy instead. I was getting manicures every other day and receiving facials, not giving them. From the moment I stepped in, one girl gave me a facial, and before I knew it, she was performing oral sex on me. It seemed like I was getting intimate every three minutes, whether it was in closets or on massage tables. It was a whirlwind of passion. Despite this, I was supposed to be learning hair cutting, but I was the worst student imaginable. On one occasion, I was cutting a lady's hair and she suddenly fell silent. Confused, I asked if she was deaf, only to realize I had accidentally cut the wire of her hearing aid. It was a ridiculous mistake, but I shrugged it off as the girls at the school would fix it for me. Another incident occurred when an older woman requested a blue rinse for her gray hair. The school was too busy, so they convinced me to do it. I applied the blue solution without diluting it, resulting in her hair turning sky blue. Panicked, I excused myself and informed the owner, urging him to handle the situation. He protested, claiming she was my responsibility, but I refused to be involved, knowing she would react erratically upon seeing her reflection. When I returned, the entire school was in a frenzy. Despite the owner's attempts, the blue color remained, and he had to offer numerous free services to appease the woman. Being at the beauty school also exposed me to the way women, particularly the customers, conversed in beauty parlors. They were incredibly open and discussed the most intimate topic. One day, a woman divulged her experiences, including giving her husband a memorable oral encounter with ice cubes. Her explicit words aroused me, making it challenging to focus on my task. Irritated, I snapped at her, exclaiming, Do you think I'm some kind of pervert? You can't share such things with me. In my frustration, I threw down the comb and stormed out. Unfortunately, my girlfriend Louise discovered the rumors surrounding my behavior at the school, leading her to enroll 
in an attempt to keep an eye on me. The other girls were sly and cunning, not caring about her relationship with me. However, I lucked out because she blamed them for any perceived indiscretions. As graduation approached, I realized that if I wanted to expand beyond petty crime and open a legitimate business like a bar, disco, or gambling operation, I needed connections in the mob. 